It's another edition of Tyra about the movies and new week. We have a new month of movies to start off with. Uh, we're looking at the movies of August 1990, starting with the first weekend, August 3rd. we got four movies to look at today, so let's not waste any time. Let's just jump right on into it with the first movie, the sequel to the 1988 Western action comedy Young Guns, entitled Young Guns 2. It is therefore considered by the court that William H. Bonney be hanged till he be dead, dead, dead. You can go to hell, hell, hell. <laughs> Buenas tardes, amigos. You're not dead. Do I look dead? <laughs> the entire country is reading about our territory every day in the journals. Should we give them a proper burial? And they're not reading about our growth towards statehood. I never stole a horse from someone I didn't like. Now you just kill him. What they are reading about is a 21-year-old delinquent. What scum? Who is making us look like imbeciles. Politicians, bankers, cattle kings. Scum. I got 18 dimes in each barrel, boy. You're starting to believe what they're writing about you, aren't you? <laughs> you wrote a 15-year-old boy straight into his grave. Goodbye, Bob. This dog rest of us went straight to hell. I don't take to tenderfoots in my gang. It ain't your gang, Dave. Let's hire you a thief. Thousand dollars, Mr. Garrett, to catch one. And all the resources you need to carry out the extermination. Just playing the game, Doc. Except one William H. Bonnie. Even their horses are crazy. We'll give them a game on. We're starting to surround us. We gotta get out of here. Dave, it's your gang. What? It's your gang. It's always been your gang. Emilio Estevez, Keeper Sutherland, Lou Diamond Phillips, Christian Slater, Balthazar Getty, Alan Ruck, James Coburn, and William Peterson as Pat Garrett. You who? I'll make you famous. Young Guns 2. So the first movie you basically had some of the hottest young teen actors at the time in the 1980s. Uh, Emilio Estevez, Keeper Sutherland, Lou Diamond Phillips, Charlie Sheen. Dermot Moroni, Casey Shimosko, you also had Terry O'Quinn, Terrence Stamp, and Jack Palance in it. And it was a fun movie. It was a fun, it was a fun, well-made movie. Uh, mostly because of the, the chemistry between the cast. I like the idea that they had where they tried to... They basically did a retelling of the story of Billy the Kid, and they did it with these actors. And it works pretty well for what it is. It's a fun movie. I, t I really enjoyed the first movie. The second one is... Uh, hit and miss like it does have a lot of the same elements that made the first movie really enjoyable but like with most sequels it is kind of repeating the same formula and the same story that they did for the fir first movie they bring it into this movie here and nearly half the cast of this movie is not f from the last movie is not in this new movie granted you have Estevez Sutherland and Diamond Phillips back but you replace the other young actors from the pr previous movie and you have Christian Slater in here uh, Alan Ruck, Balthazar Getty, William Peterson, who plays, um, uh, they just said in the trailer, now I can't remember the name, Pat Garrett. Pat Garrett, uh, is who William Peterson plays. And, um, it does have its moments, like, there are moments in here where that magic from the first movie is still in here, but again, it kind of, it kind of falls into sequelitis, honestly. It's a movie that has some stuff in there that's good, but... It definitely feels like a repeat of the previous film, but unlike movies like Another Forty Eight Hours or RoboCop Two, where it feels like they're not, where it feels like that ma is they're not even trying; they're just make tr making a quick buck. You can tell that at least they're trying in this movie, and there are moments in here that do work. Plus, the acting overall is still pretty good. Plus, this movie has a pretty good soundtrack of John Bon Jovi's "The Blaze of Glory" is in this came from this movie. So, I mean, like I said, there are moments in here that are very good. But overall, it's definitely less a lesser movie than the previous film it was. But it's okay for what it is. If you could, if you could t tolerate a, de a sequel that's going to be pretty much the same as the first movie, I think you'll definitely enjoy it. It's not one I'd watch over and over again, but every once in a while, I'll definitely check it out. And I kind of would like to see what a young, a new version of Young Guns in a modern, in a mo with a modern cast. What am I even trying to say here? A, content a cast of some of the younger actors of today would look like. So. That'd be kind of interesting to see, honestly. I'm actually kind of I'm actually kind of intrigued that they haven't even tried to do a remake of this yet. But knowing how, but knowing how pretty much everything in the past is going to get remade eventually, it's going to happen at some point. So 
yeah, I'm kind of curious to see what they would do with a, with a new version of Young Guns today, but Young Guns 2, not as good as the first movie, but still kind of enjoyable. I enjoyed it for what it was, so let's go ahead and move on to the next movie, and that is Spike Lee's follow-up to Do the Right Thing, and that is Denzel Washington in Mo' Better Blues. I want a man who knows what he wants. Ah, I know what I want. Fun music. Everything else is secondary. What did you and I do is not make love. <laughs> what would you call it, Dad? It's definitely not making love. You ever heard of the Mo Better? Mo what? Mo Better makes it Mo Better. What about Delvis? I like her too. I like women. When you say it was annoying in one shot, they wear the same dress and the same day and see each other. <laughs> Like it or not, you're a dog. You're a good doggy, but you're a dog nonetheless. Get off! What? What did you call me? I mean, how in the hell can you call me by her name? Boy, they got all kind of people in this club tonight. Look at that little ugly guy at the bar. Hey, fella! <laughs> trying to sneak in here in the colored section. I see you. He's a horrible manager. Everybody can see that but you. The midget should go over there. You know my name is Giant. Every night we go over this. Look, Giant is my friend. Giant? That's a joke. Is that a joke? It's a joke. I couldn't manage a little thing. I don't leave. You keep coming up short. No, 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 no. It's because she's white. Is she white? Because she's white. Yes. Oh. Yeah, she's a nun. Won't give me none. Ain't had none. Oh, she didn't. She didn't need none. Pirates are playing the Mets in the doubleheader. Give me the Pirates in both games. The Mets need some more black ball players. What are you gambling again? How much you owe? Don't break him. Let's give him a break. Break his legs, his arms. <laughs> Everybody's deaf, brother. Ain't nobody listening. People are you got listening a voice. to my voice. My oh, yeah, voice. You put them lips on the trumpet. Academy Award winner Denzel Washington in a new film from Spike Lee. We thank you for coming because you didn't have to come. You could have stayed home and uh, watched us in your hall or something. <laughs> Mo Better Blues. Of course, for Spike Lee to follow up such a masterpiece of a movie like Do the Right Thing, that was always going to be a tough act to do. It's always like that whenever somebody makes a fantastic movie and then they have to deliver a movie that hopefully is as good or even better than what they did before, but uh, Mo' Better Blues is certainly not a bad movie by any means, but it definitely pales in comparison to Do the Right Thing. There are still a lot of great elements to the film. You put, Denz I mean, you put Denzel Washington in anything, he'll make it a better movie almost immediately. Like I said, I like I said before, I really don't think he's made a terrible, terrible movie. He's made a, he probably made, has made a movie where the movie itself wasn't all that good, but he was usually given it his all. But yeah, he usually will never deliver a really terrible movie, at least as far as I'm concerned. But you got the rest of the cast in here working very well: Wesley Snipes, Spike Lee, John Turturro, John Carlo Esposito, Robin Harris, uh, Bill Nunn, Cinda Williams. Uh, you still got the great cinematography by Ernest Dickerson. Uh, Bill Lee has a very good score. The music in general overall is very well done. You got jazz music by uh, Terrence Blanchard, who would later become Spike's primary composer on many of his movies, as well as Branford Marsalis. The biggest problem with the movie is that the story is kind of all over the place. There's definitely a lot of flaws in the storytelling. The pacing is really off at times. For a movie that's just a little over two hours, you really never get that full satisfaction that you did with the runtime of Do the Right Thing. And, I mean, the overall tone of the movie doesn't really work all that well. This film is supposed to take place in 1969 Brooklyn, and the movie opens up with Flavor Flay talking over the Universal Studios logo, which is fun, but it doesn't really fit the tone of the movie itself, of what the movie is trying to be. It's, it just feels kind of... It just feels like Flavor Flav did it, did it as a favor to Spike Lee because they're friends or something like that, but it's not a bad... Like I said, it's not bad, but it definitely feels out of place for what the movie is trying to be. So like I said, it's not a bad movie. There are still moments in here that I really do appreciate, but the film itself is just kind of a mixed bag. It's not one of Spike Lee's worst films by any means, but it definitely failed to, failed to repeat the same success that Do the Right Thing did. 
I mean, it's worth watching at least once just to see a Denzel, good Denzel Washington movie, but it's not classic by any means necessary. And I think Spike Lee did a much better job with his next film, which we'll get into when we get into 1991. But that's my thoughts on Mo Better Blues. Now let's move on to the next movie. And quite honestly, this is probably the best movie released this weekend. And that was, surprisingly not, surprisingly enough, DuckTales the movie, Treasure of the Lost Land. ancient pyramid of Kalibaba, where a fabulous treasure has lay hidden for centuries. A treasure sought by a ruthless sorcerer. A treasure whose incredible mysteries are about to be uncovered. Jumpstart my heart! By six daring adventurers. I finally found it! But finding the fortune is only the beginning. Of a powerful secret. Bless me, that will lead to unbelievable magic. I wish for the treasure of Kolibaba. <laughs> that will become one unforgettable adventure. I'd sure like to know where this leads. <laughs> I'm not so sure you do. It's your favorite DuckTales friends oh. in their first full-length big screen motion picture. A story filled with excitement. You better get back here! Danger. Hey. Surprises. Is there a doctor in the pyramid? And fun. It's easy for you to say. It's a movie so big, so special, so exciting. You're No TV can hold it. DuckTales the movie. Treasure of the Lost Lamp. It's hard to believe that in 1990, Disney not only created one movie, but two animated movies that would end up becoming one of their most, some of their most underrated works. Like, we had this movie, and then we had The Rescuers Down Under, and this is coming right after they just did The Little Mermaid. And it's just like, what happened that both DuckTales and Rescuers Down Under ended up underperforming so, ba so badly at the box office, but they would later go on to become cult classics in their own rights? Uh, DuckTales the movie is amazing. Like, this is a movie that is a lot better than I think a lot of people would give it credit for. This is a movie that's more based off the old Carl Banks comics that the that the original series was based off of, even though the elements of the TV show are still very much used here. Uh, the animation is incredible. There's a lot of good writing in this movie. Uh, Alan Burnett, who would later go out and do Batman the Animated Series, wrote this. Uh, the action is very good. The voice work is, once again, top-notch. It paces itself very nicely. It doesn't feel rushed at all, even though it's only about 75 minutes long it knows when to wrap the story up and it knows that it does a good job of keeping the pace up so you can keep you keep getting invested in what's going on and there's nothing really more i can say about it i mean this is just a fantastic movie it's a shame that it didn't do well at the box office but then again august is not usually the best time to release a family film even for disney uh very rarely do you have a family film in august that actually makes a big profit at the box office and Unfortunately, this killed what could have what the, what could have been for the Disney Afternoon series because they were actually going to work on a Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers animated movie after this movie came out, but that got shelved and we wouldn't get a real Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers movie until the recent movie on Disney Plus. But um, and we and honestly, we wouldn't get a Disney Afternoon movie esque movie esque type movie until we get a Goofy movie, which is pretty much Goof Troop the movie when you really look at it, but. It's interesting. It's interesting what could have been, but DuckTales the movie really is an incredible movie, a very underrated movie. Great, It's great all around. I can't recommend it enough. Definitely check it out if you haven't seen it already. So, on to the last movie, and that is the directorial debut of Whit Stillman, and that is Metropolitan. Tom is the only guy I've ever liked in my whole life. I'm not going to forget about him because of some apparent inconsistency. I crushed on Serena with some ups and downs for over two years. Serena had an incredible number of boyfriends, at least 20. Rip Barnes, Monica, and Serena spoke still together. Well, one thing's for certain, she's lost her virginity by now. How can you say that? You're right. Yes. Maybe she wasn't a virgin. Is it true you're barren? As a matter of fact, it is. I don't think I took anything seriously, though. 
Rick Von Sloniker is tall, rich, good looking, stupid, dishonest, conceited, in short, highly attractive to women. I don't see how that can be bad. I shouldn't have to go into all the sordid details. Well, could you go into a few sordid details? They're doomed. What are you talking about? Downward social mobility? They're bourgeois. Shut, shut, shut. Playing strip poker with an exhibitionist somehow takes the challenge away. And in love. I mean, for them, men are either dates, potential dates, or date substitutes. Well, I find that dehumanizing. They're all so very metropolitan. So basically, it's just a movie that's following the lives of these so young socialites and debutantes. And they're just, it's mostly a dialogue driven movie with these young actors. And if you've seen Whit Stillman's work, that's pretty much what you kind of expect from him. But overall, it is a very good movie. You do like these actors. I like that they feel realistic. None of them is just hogging it up for the camera in a way. These are actors, these are young actors who feel, who actually feel realistic. They don't feel like somebody that's just trying to get a quick, trying to start a quick indie movie so they can blow up and become big blockbuster stars. I don't, it doesn't, they don't feel that way when you watch this movie. It's a, it's a very good movie. It's a very nicely, it's nicely edited. It's nicely shot by John Thomas. The music is very well done. The writing works for, very well. It has a lot of relatable elements that I think a lot of people can relate to, even if you're not a rich person like these people are. And it, it's, a, it's a movie that doesn't feel like you're, you're sitting there for way too long. The movie does move at a smooth enough pace where you can keep up and get invested in what these characters are going through. It's a very good movie. It's a good start for Stillman as a director. He would do, actually do a couple of these movies that feel very similar, like the part of a trilogy, like you'd have Barcelona, which would be in, released about four years later, and then The Last Days of Disco, which would be in 1998. But uh, like I said, like I've always said, we'll get there when we get there, but Metropolitan's not a bad start for him. It's a good movie, a well-made film. If you haven't seen it, I'd say definitely check it out if you really like movies like it definitely feels a lot like kind of my dinner with Andre type of a, a type of movie like that. It definitely feels that way. If you haven't seen if you haven't seen this movie, I'd say definitely check it out. Metropolitan. So with that said, that's going to wrap up another edition of Time About the Movies. Next time around, we'll, we've got four movies to look at, including Flatliners from director Joel Schumacher, starring Keith Sutherland, Julia Roberts, William Baldwin, Oliver Platt, and Kevin Bacon. In addition, we have Mel Gibson and Robert Downey Jr. working together in Air America. And we also have Jack Nicholson making his feature directorial debut with the long overdue, the long delayed Chinatown sequel, and that is the Two Jakes and Twister, not the '96 movie, not the block, not the blockbuster Twister, but Twister. So we'll look at those four movies next time around. So I hope you'll be there for that. Other than that, though, thank you guys for watching. And as always, if you want to see more videos like this, check out the playlist on the next page. Check out the previous episode, and I'll see you guys tomorrow for another new episode. So until then, take care.